Okay, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Mark Fennell. Um, and I'm an associate director at ACOM, where I lead up the invasive species management team. And I and I and I thought about this this first slide, great big pile of earth movers, muck shifters. I thought I would put it in as a stark contrast to what I assumed uh, would come before, and, and and yes, it is. Um, and the reason and the connection between that image and plants, plant blindness, uh, is well, it's legislation uh, actually. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So it is. It is uh, linked and relevant, and hopefully that'll come clear uh, as we talk on. So I've, I've been quite lucky, really. Um, I studied plant science in university, went on to do a PhD in uh, invasion, uh, invasive species plants as well. Then got a job in environmental consultancy where I've been surveying for writing reports associated with plants along with my various colleagues, I mean, at ACOM, we have a, have a team of about 200 or more uh, ecologists, uh, spend all my working time dealing with them and we're all dealing with plants and, and, and whatnot. So the whole plant blindness thing kind of goes past me, um, but at the same time, I am uh, very aware of, of some of the shortcomings in terms of candidates and so forth. This isn't, oh, there we go. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about environmental consulting, but I'm going to focus on invasive species since that's that's what I do uh, day to day. Um, but I will um, provide a little bit of information on the sort of the, the general topic of plant identification with respect to environmental consulting. But first, and importantly, and hopefully this this will fit into the time allowance. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to do a, a competition. See. Um, although having seen the results of the uh, the, the survey that uh, Karen's student I think uh, carried out, uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not too certain how well people will do. But in order to encourage people to play along, uh, there will be fantastic prizes without giving too much away. Um, it's a mug, but it's a nice mug, so you know it's worth it's worth going for. I'm going to show through the talk 16 images. Karen, can you this? Uh, so I so send around the link. It's now the link is now in the chat. Um, Very good. So if people open that, they can uh, write in their answers as they go. Don't forget name and email address if you want to win the mug. Very good. I mean, you know, just saying, ACOM is hiring. So for the students out there who uh, want to, um, you know, start a dialogue, good at identifying plants, you know, here's an opportunity. Um, so. I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. If you're if you're not quick at filling in the form and all that kind of stuff, just whip out a pen and, and start jotting them down. And we'll say, uh, as there's a few things left today, if you get this back to me by 5 p.m., if you don't get it back by 5 p.m., it won't be counted. If you get them all right, whoever gets them all right first wins. And what would be cool, Karen, I think, is if we can put all these images also into those ID apps you showed, and then we'll create a leaderboard, humans versus AI. Versus the botanist friend I sent him to who got 100%. So there we go. So I'll leave these images up here for a little bit longer. Hopefully people are playing along. But that first one, image one, is an interesting one because it's something that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and that's, it's a very recognizable plant. It might be obvious from that image, um, but it does highlight the importance of being able to identify plants and uh, not just in the middle of the summer, but when they're getting going early in the season. So that one highlights the importance there. The number three down there is an interesting one. You often smell that um, before you see it. So things like smell and odor uh, are quite important, actually, when it comes to identification. It can even help you find certain species. And number four there is an interesting one. Interesting impacts originally planted for cover for game. It's now a, a key a asymptomatic carrier of some pretty nasty fungal pathogens that are infecting in particular oak trees around around the UK. So I'll skip on past that. Hopefully these, these are easy ones. So you should hopefully have all gotten those, hopefully. So now a little brief, brief uh, discussion on environmental consultancy, but I won't linger too long on each slide. And I'll get onto the stuff specific to invasive species. So as I said, me and my colleagues, uh, a few hundred of us, 
day to day, most days of the year, out and about. A uh, fundamental component of what we do is plant identification. Uh, the, the starting point of, of most ecological assessments, preliminary ecological appraisals within environmental consultancy, which has to be done for you know, all, all development essentially, uh, is the, the habitat survey and the functional, the, the starting point for that is, is, is plants. It's, it's working out what plants are there and, and what the different habitats are. So, I mean, you need to be able to identify plants to be able to, to do this job. You need to know what plants um, are indicator species for, for certain types of habitats. It's going to be difficult to identify a, a reed bed if you don't know what reed looks like as a, as a basic example. Uh, but some of the habitat types even have uh, the names baked in. So there is an example, Northern Atlantic wet heats with Erica tetralix. So the key species is part of the actual name of the habitat type. Then also rare, protected and unusual, and I'll, I'll come back to unusual in a second species as well. So these are species, and there's, there's a couple of hundred lifted, listed on section 41 of the NERC Act. Um, I doubt there's many ecologists out there that could spot all 200 of them because they're all pretty, pretty random. Um, but uh, it is worth knowing about them. So coming on to unusual species, there's a, an odd one off to the right. Now I'd I guess I'd be surprised if anybody knew what that was right off the bat, because it's only been spotted once in the UK and Ireland uh, by one of the members of our team who didn't know what it was, but knew it didn't look right. And that, that's important. Understanding what plants you usually come across in typical scenarios within habitats allows you to identify when something's not quite right. So when this peculiar looking species was poking up above the waterline, um, um, the, the, the ecologist took lots of photographs and uh, brought them to our attention and it was the first confirmed record of um, broadleaf water milfoil in the UK. There was a BSBI article about it. Actually, botanists got in contact with us. They wanted to know where it was. They wanted to go and have a look. We said, no, can't go see it. They wanted to take samples and it's kind of not the point we want to deal with it. And the EA came along and they've been trying to lock it down before it becomes a big issue. It's a major issue in other parts of Europe. But uh, the information that's collected in these habitat surveys um, creates a baseline from which monitoring can be carried out, feeds into impact assessments, is used within the planning application process, discharging conditions, gaining consent, uh, but also, and importantly, developing mitigation strategies whether those mitigation strategies are for protected species or invasive species, uh, that's kind of the end point. It's all right, we, we now know what's here. What do we need to do about it? Um, and knowing what species are, are present can, can actually be quite important and making sure you get those identifications right can be quite important. So if someone's out doing a standard uh, habitat survey, and this has happened a few times, and it's almost resulted in issues, but it's always been caught. But some plants, um, hemlock, for example, are often recorded as giant hogweed or Japanese knotweed. It's been big for the last few years and it's throwing people off. And when that happens, and you can get to the point where you're almost creating a mitigation strategy against giant hogweed, and then you realize, oh wait, that would have been a very expensive error to make. So it's, it's not just um, spotting species and being able to identify, it's make sure when you do identify species, you've actually got it right. And the plants can be tricky sometimes. Cotoneasters, for example, are a nightmare. So these habitat surveys, functional part of the preliminary ecological appraisal, create that baseline I was talking about, uh, used to identify the need for additional surveys. And they're all based on indicator species, indicator plant species, and species composition. So it's, it's really all very much reliant on a, on, on a good to, to very good um, botanical ability. And some of those additional surveys then that, that spring up from the, the phase one surveys, phase twos, well, I mean, in, in some scenarios, you literally have to be able to catalog every single plant species that's present in, in a, given uh, a given location to get to national vegetation classification. So obviously in that scenario, good plant skills are very important, but 
within our team of a couple of hundred, there's only really a handful, maybe a couple of handfuls that could go out and do those really high detail surveys where you need to be able to identify everything. It is not a common skill. And if you've got it, you've got a job, you know, I mean, and not just in ACOM, in, in many other environmental consultancies across the country. Ways of demonstrating that you've got competency to an employer like ACOM or anyone else, and being a member of SIEM, just from a standard ecology uh, perspective, but then also for plant identification, there's actually not much out there in terms of standards, uh, except for uh, FISC, which is a field identification skills certificate, uh, which is coordinated by the BSBI. So membership to SIEM, having a FICS, uh, useful qualifications. So on to invasive species. Uh, and I mentioned drivers earlier. I mentioned uh, legislation was a key one. I'll talk about that in a second. We've got four more images here. So we've got a, an aquatic uh, plant just to uh, mix things up as well. And it's interesting uh, in terms of environmental consultancy. Um, aquatic plants, aquatic animals as well, are becoming very in vogue, very fashionable to, fashionable to be able to identify them, know what they are and know how to deal with them because of this, um, the new requirements set forth by the Environment Agency for transferring water, because you need to make sure you've mitigated any risks associated with the spread of invasive species. That starts with actually knowing what they look like and being able to identify them in the first place. So another hint just for anybody looking at these images, I know it can be tricky to identify a plant from a small image, but they're all on legislation relevant to the UK and Ireland. So that should help you narrow it down. That other one there was an interesting example. So doing a survey of a site, there's a, a botanic, well, not a botanic gardens, a, an ornamental garden, it's quite a nice one on the other side of the lake. Um, and it was filled with all sorts of exotic, but listed invasive plants. And a bunch of them had uh, wandered across and uh, established on the other side of the lake. Number seven there is an interesting one for sense of scale. That, that field is about half a mile, the, the, the end of that. That's where I did my PhD. I, I fit quite neatly under those plants, taking leaf samples to do genetic analysis. So they're, they're big, two meters plus. So hopefully you've had a chance to uh, jot down those four species. I'll give you another few sections. And number eight, there's sold in, well, just about any nursery you want to wander into, which is interesting because the legislation says you can't plant or otherwise cause to grow these species in the wild. It does say the wild. But yet many of them are for sale in garden centers and nurseries. In the UK and Ireland, so it's a bit of a bit of a grey area there, I'd say. So moving on. So drivers, legislation, the key ones. So I mean, some people's opinion on whether you should deal with invasive species or not um, acknowledged. Some people think that they should be let uh, do their thing. The changes in composition of species over time is is natural. I'd argue that it's not not at this speed. Um, and the legislation backs up that opinion. So the legislation is what matters when it comes to development, when it comes to decision making. So if it's listed on relevant legislation, as I said, for a plant, you can plant it, otherwise cause to grow. And then also waste in Ireland and in the UK, it's, uh, it's classified differently. So there can be quite substantial requirements with, res uh, with respect to um, the proper handling of waste containing invasive plants. So if you have topsoil, which typically could be stripped and reused and possibly even sold, instead you've got a, a controlled waste that would cost uh, as, as much as 2000 pounds for 10 cubic meters to dispose of, which is slightly different uh, in terms of cost for a developer. Um, it's also interesting that, that there is legislation associated with native species. So ragwort, for example, if you found that in a, in a grazing pasture, um, you'd, you'd want to be able to identify that and understand the, the issues. It's, it's, it's toxic to, to cows and, and horses and so forth. Location, location, location. So 
you can see a, a map there off to the side. A culvert is going in. It's a EA development flood alleviation. Um, and it's quite a lot of Japanese knotweed, which can cause significant financial implications, primarily associated with that waste legislation that I mentioned. But accurate mapping, knowing exactly where it is, shows, well, actually, it's pretty much out of the way. And this problem can be solved with a few fences. So understanding location is quite important. The biology of a plant, which requires you to know what the plant is, is, is paramount to its management. So understanding, is it seed producing? Is it rhizome producing? How does it spread? How does it persist? And that factors into when you need to treat it. If you start spraying herbicide on giant hogweed at the end of August after it's set seed, well, that's not going to do anything, is it? And it also allows you to understand the biosecurity that needs to be taken both then and later. Ultimately, being able to identify these species allows you to give the right advice to a landowner, to a land manager, or to a client. And if you can't identify these species, well, then whatever documentation you produced, assuming these species are present, won't be fit for purpose because you'll have missed key elements which potentially have significant ramifications for de development in terms of schedule and, and cost but I'll, I'll come on to those implications in, in a minute then obviously compliance with environmental and waste legislation so if you don't know about certain species that are present and you're walking through them tracking through them moving soils around without any um, due care, and those species are getting into uh, rivers, woodlands adjacent, then that could be a breach of legislation and um, with associated potential for prosecution or fines. So it's quite important to identify these species, not to be blind to them as you're carrying out surveys in an environmental consulting perspective. If you misidentify, like I said, money, time, reputation, your reputation is going to take a spill. Your relationship with the landowner, with the client can be can be hit. Um, as I said, breaches of legislation can follow. And then also the legislation is there to protect the environment. So negative environmental impacts can follow also. So a few examples just to um, highlight a few of those points I'll get to in a, in a second. So we've got another set of four species here for our competition. And don't forget the mug. It's a very nice mug, it really is. Um, we've got the one at the top, which is an interesting example. The Environment Agency in, in England in particular right now is clamoring to get on top of that one um, with limited success. It spreads very quickly. The one below is, a, is an interesting example because you'll see it planted in a lot of gardens, it really is quite a popular species. It makes for a great hedge. It makes for um, a nice boundary plant, but if it gets near certain types of habitat, it can be very problematic. And the same goes for the one below, also quite a popular um, plant in landscaped areas, but you'll often see it spilling out of gardens into woodlands where it can completely swamp the understory um, and, a, and a site that that um, we are working on in London. When we got there, the majority of the bluebells that were present in this woodland were sporadic at best. And when we got rid of the species in question, the, the bluebells, they all came trundling back with glee. So that was nice to see. And number 12 there, another example of a very, very popular plant. At least, at least a few people in this talk probably have it in their garden or know someone who does. And it's still sold uh, in, in, in many nurseries, highlighting that issue again. And all of these different species as well. And uh, one of the things that's nice to learn about beyond their names and their biology, which you, you need to understand to identify and manage them, but also their histories. Most of them have quite interesting introduction stories, where they came from, how they got here and what happened next. So it's quite a fascinating subject from a history perspective as well. So moving on to the next slide. So just examples, I'm not 
going to go through that list or anything there. You can see, do you remember, I think the, the mouse works, that was that map I showed you and fences and a bit of soil protection were all that was needed to, to avoid costly remediation in that particular example. And it's fun coming up with pragmatic solutions rather than sort of sticking to the, oh, you got to dig it out approach that a lot of people take. But interesting examples of the importance of identification I just sort of put this up as a splash screen. So there was this example, it was a, it was a residential development in, in London. And there was a small patch of Japanese knotweed um, located adjacent to a compound. And they were digging up large parts of the site and they were stockpiling. And the stockpile was about, by the end of it, it was about 300 cubic meters of soil and rubble and all this kind of stuff. Now, all of which could be reused um, in various contexts. In fact, some of which had monetary value. Unfortunately, no one spotted the stand of knotweed, an, an invasive plant that many will be aware of, that was lurking between uh, those two locations where the material was being excavated and the material was being stockpiled. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that entire stockpile, by the time I got involved, by the time I was brought out to take a look, was filled with knotweed. And you remember what I said about changes in waste classifications. You go, eh you know, 3,000 cubic meters, that doesn't sound too bad, until you realize that what used to have monetary value now is quarter of a million pounds worth of waste um, to get rid of. Uh, it's that 50 pounds worth of netlon that would have stopped this from happening seems like a bargain. So getting in early, spotting these things can allow you to solve a problem for 50 pounds instead of quarter of a million. There's another example in London for quite a large development, and they didn't notice that knotweed was present before they purchased the land. Um, and because of the, the waste implications of that, um, the, the cost to remediate it was, was well over a million pounds, um, which, which was a knock to the bottom line. Had they spotted it in advance, they might've been able to come to an arrangement to mitigate some of that cost uh, in advance. But then there's, you know, there's, there's, there's positive examples where you do spot the invasive species well in advance and you can produce pragmatic solutions like fences and soil protection, um, interesting ways of dealing with problems in a cost-effective manner. Um, when you do spot these things and you do get ahead of it and you do uh, talk to developers and you, you come up with plans together, it's, 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 it's an interesting dialogue to come up with a pragmatic solution that, that works with how a site works. It works with how they're building the thing. You know, it, it can't just be some theoretical, this is best practice. These are the steps you need to take. It needs to tie in and link up with real world stuff. And another example, uh, quite important, and this is to do with Knotweed, and I've mentioned Knotweed a lot, but, the reason is because that actually makes up, you know, probably 50% of the, the work that I do is related to that species. It's kind of gone the other way in terms of plant blindness. Everybody knows what it looks like and everybody's finding it. And in England, Wales, somewhat in Scotland and alarmingly starting in Ireland now, um, if you've got knotweed in your back garden, just this little sprig, tiny bit, um, your property can be valued at zero. So it can go from whatever number of hundreds of thousands to zero unless you um, buy up to a rather expensive uh, insurance-backed mitigation program. Uh, and as well, myself and Karen have done some research around the area and we're looking to enact change, but it's, it's, a, it's a very strange scenario. And because of that scenario, which is very, it's happening, it's real uh, from a mortgage lender's perspective, it worries them. Um, but in this example, uh, a president, a surveyor, uh, surveyed a property, um, didn't spot not, we didn't take any photographs, so can't prove in any way whether it was there or not. Um, maybe it had been covered up, but he couldn't demonstrate it. Either way, not we was found after the property was purchased. He was found to be negligent in his duty because he didn't spot what he should have been able to spot. Uh, and he was fined 50,000 pounds 
and he lost. He lost the case, and it's set a precedent now. So in the courts, there is a precedent. If you don't spot knotweed when you ought to have in a property survey, you can be fined. And that fine wasn't just for the cost of control. It was for impacts on the value of the house. So the reduction in property, which they estimated at 40,000, coming to a total of 50,000. That would be an unpleasant um, letter to get in the post. And right now, going through the system, uh, ecologists doing a preliminary ecological appraisal missed Japanese knotweed and has been dragged through the courts for a preliminary ecological appraisal. Now, the scope of that wouldn't necessarily have been species level identification of invasives, but was that in the scope that they produced? Was that clearly caveated? I don't know. Anyway, it's been tested in the courts right now. So just a standard ecologist doing a standard appraisal potentially liable for significant costs. So before I wrap up, um, some useful tips that I've picked up along the way for up and coming ecologists um, that I think are sort of key, key things to be aware of uh, if, you're, if you're getting into environmental consultancy and particularly if you're getting into invasive species. But before, we've got four more species. We've got my least favorite plant on the planet. Um, at the top, number 13, huh? unlucky 13. Um, it's an aquatic plant, but I've seen ponds so heavily riddled with the stuff that ducks were just wandering across the top. I've got some great photographs, levitating ducks. 14 there is an interesting one because in the UK, there's a biological control available for dealing with it. So if you're out managing invasive plants, and you need a, a, a environmentally sound and sensible way um, of uh, dealing with uh, this particular plant, you can go to a website and you can buy these little weevils and you can release them and they'll, it's amazing. You, you, I mean, you do it for fun. If you can get some of the pay to do it even better, um, but they'll eat it all and then they'll die. But, you know, they do eat it all before they do that. Um, and I've put in number 16 because, well, I don't think anybody would have identified it, but I did say its name earlier. So, and no, no cheating, no, I think this has been recorded. So no rewinding back and seeing what I said. I'll know, you won't know how I know, but I will know. So, you know, but I, I was gonna remove it because of that, but I said, well, what's the point of these things is to talk about, you know, different and unusual plants and to raise awareness. So, you know, sort of hammers home that point by, well, I've talked about it and there it is. Have you remembered? So very quickly, how to keep out of hot water. And I know I'm verging on running over time, so I'll move through this quickly. Always define your scope. If you don't know what all the invasive species look like, don't say you're doing an invasive species survey. Caveat, plants can be present uh, in forms that are not visible. They might be present as seed or spore and grow later. Specify that caveat that the plants might be present in a form that cannot be identified records, taking photographs of as much of the site as is practical, methodological approach to moving through the site, know the species, know their different forms, know what they look like at different times of the year, their habitat preferences, where they're likely to be found adjacent to water bodies, railways, different identification pathways. So are there, are there tracks trundling through a stand? Where are they going? Um, the world doesn't end at the boundary. Is there other plants upstream that are just going to come right back down and infest the site or that will infest the site uh, shortly? Create a group. I know we've talked about it. We use this in our, in our team. We have an invasive species ID group. We all share ID material all the time. And if you can't identify something in the field, we use it to identify it. And don't be the person introducing seeds to the site. Make sure you've implemented biosecurity before you get there and before you leave. So there's a few tips on these slides. You've got them uh, in, your, in, your, in your slide pack on what to do if you do find an invasives. Getting good photographs is important and taking lots of records, including spatial records using GPS. In terms of identification, don't just go by what's in the ID books. Everybody knows, or a lot of people know what the most ecologists know what not what it looks like but would you spot it after it's been treated with herbicide? Would you spot it if it's just been strimmed over in spring before the, the, the growth starts for the year? Would you spot it when it's just a, a little leaf emerging from the ground? 
Everybody knows what giant hogweed looks like when it's big and juicy, but would you spot it when it looks like that? I was on a site yesterday, uh, the top right image there. That was pretty much all of the information available. And the same goes for Himalayan balsam. Make sure you know what that looks like when it's a little seedling as well, or when it's died back for the winter. So all the different forms. Thank you.